So hi, everybody. My name is Justin Gerardo, and this panel is our Your Skills Are Complete, Building Your Own Arcade Joysticks. Uh, we're going to focus on what a joystick is, what switches are, how they interface with your video game consoles. We're going to talk about classic consoles and how you can use your joystick that you're going to be building to interface with Atari, ColecoVision, Sega Master System, Sega Genesis. And then we're going to talk a little bit about NES controllers, Super Nintendo controllers, and shift registers. We're not going to go too far into that, but we will go into kind of the theory of it so that you have some understanding of it. So you can trust that when you use something like that, when you use a USB encoder and use um, kind of the products that are already available that are simple to use, that you will have some understanding so that you have a jumping off point in case you want to learn more. It gets really into it. I'm not going to go into USB because that is um, a whole, you know, three or four panels, I would say, um, to do that. But just trust that it works and that it's um, something that you can kind of start looking into if you're interested in making more complex builds. Okay, um, my panelists, who we are? My panelists, whoop, that's not good. Julio Alamansar, unfortunately, he's not here today. Um, it's too bad, but he is a new daddy. He's a new father um, of beautiful um, girls. A uh, beautiful little girl um, was born to him and his wife, Dana, who helped us with the presentation with the PowerPoint. Um, so congratulations to him. Uh, he's great. He's um, uh, a sports game specialist, you know, especially fighting games. He loves fighting games. So, um, and also the greatest shifting host of all time, self-proclaimed, self-proclaimed. Um, and um, he helped me with this panel, and unfortunately he couldn't be here. Um, but thanks to him, and congratulations again, Julio, on being a father. Um, a little bit more about me. My name is Justin, like I said. I'm a chip music promoter in New York City. I owe chip music since 2009. Along with uh, my fellow staff members, we put on a lot of electronic music shows and focus on visualists and chip music in the New York City area, one time in Japan. Um, also visualist, played the main stage last year. Um, you know, so it's, you know, very, very, big kind of high deal, deal for me, a highlight um, of doing that. Uh, video game collector for since I was a kid and amateur electrician, um, self-taught mostly, but some training from the US Navy. Um, and since uh, 2000, I believe, I've been just tinkering and doing electronic video game repair. So I've had a little bit of experience with this and I'm happy to be able to share some of what I've learned with you today. Okay. So let's get started with switches and buttons. Um, switches, as simple as light switches, for example, um, are just a way that we control um, electronics. We, we usually do something, um, usually turning something on, turning something off, activating something, a lot of different types of switches. Uh, we're all familiar with light switches, but there are very many other types, such as rotary, such as uh, encoder. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into that, but for example, momentary switches are the ones that you press and hold down. Can you close the door if you don't mind? On the back. Just to get some of the outside noise down. Max. It's hard to see, it's hard to read. Sure. Sorry, Joe. I can't maximize this. Okay. And I believe that should do it. There we go. Is that better? Great, thank you. All right. Um, switches, so light switches, for example, are the ones we are um, usually all most familiar with. They turn the lights on and off. They usually have some kind of motion to them, um, activation, um, where either they move left to right or up to up down. We have rotary switches that have several positions. So like uh, on an oven where you click different positions, you turn the knob and it's got you know low, medium, high, and so on. Uh, momentary push buttons, which means that you press and hold the, the button down and that creates a connection. Um, when you let it go, then the connection is broken. So for example, um, if you press a garage door opener, usually you press the button and if you let it go, it'll stop um, closing or opening the door. And then what we call latched buttons um, so in a car, for example, we have the emergency lights, the, the blinkers. 
you press it and there's a spring as well as a latch a mechanism that holds it closed so that you don't have to keep pressing your finger on it. It'll stay pressed and then to deactivate it, you press it again. We do encounter some of those uh, with our game controllers, but usually when we're talking about video games, we use momentary push buttons, um, which is a switch, a micro switch that's connected to a button and we press and hold that button. As soon as we let it go, the connection is broken and we're not, being, we're not activating that switch anymore. Um, I'm not gonna go into toggles or sliders or knife switches or anything like that. We're gonna focus mostly on push buttons right now. Okay, so simple circuits, going back to high school, um, you have a battery or any type of power source, a wire that connects to the switch and the switch controls the load, the, the electricity that goes to the load. So a light bulb or any other type of activation um, and then it goes back. The, the, the circuit cannot work unless you have a wire that goes to um, return to the negative um, part of the um, source. So in our case, a video game console provides the power to the button, to the action, which is say um, a punch, a jump, anything like that, and a wire back to the console. And the switch is how we use um, to control that input. We have uh, more than one button typically, but for simplicity's sake, let's talk about Atari joysticks. We have just one button. We're gonna focus mostly on arcade buttons and micro switches, arcade switches, which are nice and clicky here. So I've got one here. And this micro switch, which I'll have later if you want to, uh, we can pass them around in a bit, um, connects to a, a push button so we can activate and deactivate the um, action that we want once we mount these onto a panel and um, kind of control the action. Um, joysticks are just joysticks are just a um, four buttons with four different directions connected to four of these switches. So depending on our, our direction, that's how we activate um, four switches in an arrangement that we're familiar with, like a cross pad, a D pad. Okay, and we're gonna focus specifically on digital controls, four-way and eight-way. Um, so that's the top. We're not gonna focus on analog 360 degrees. That's kind of slightly different electronics. Um, that's something for um, another day, but we are gonna focus on four-way joysticks, which go up, down, left, right, and also the diagonal, so eight-way total. Um, we're also gonna focus on the wiring and talk about how these buttons are wired up, how they're connected, um, you can see an 8-bit though controller the, uh, um, on the inside. You can see that there's uh, the black wires are kind of going from the buttons themselves to um, what we'll talk about later, which is an encoder. And you can see uh, maybe I think you can see like one, two, three, four wires coming from the four joystick sides. Um, so let's go for it. And we're, finally, we're going to talk about enclosures, ways to mount the buttons into your um, into um, an enclosure, a housing, we could say, um, so that you can store your wires, store your encoder, and then be able to um, uh, either paint or decorate it or kind of design, which is one of the things I'm gonna touch upon later, your joystick the way that you want to. Okay, so we have um, all these things put together, the joystick, the cables, the connectors, the switches, the housing, buttons and later on we'll talk about multiplexers and USB encoders but let's get um, let's start with the simplest um, kind of direct input that we have um, which is an Atari controller four buttons I'm sorry four directions and one fire button there's a nine pin connector and let's see if I can pull this up can everybody see can everybody see the uh, the uh, live feed, okay? Yes, okay. So I've got my Sega Master System um, joystick here and you can see that it's a nine pin connector here. And um, each one of these pins, each one of these holes has a wire that goes to the controller and then goes to the game system. Um, and you can see that Atari actually has the same exact connector there and take my word for it, that Sega Genesis controller um, does too. So fun fact, you can actually use a Genesis or a Master System controller on your Atari and it will work 
the B and C buttons and the, the start or the mode button will not work, but the joypad part and button A should work. Switch back. Do that, and switch back to the PowerPoint, if I can. There we go. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but these are numbered at the pin side. So one, two, three, four, five at the top, six, seven, eight, nine, and the pins correspond to different directions. So up, down, left, right, B, pin five, the one on the right over here is for the paddle, but we're not gonna concern ourselves with that right now. Pin six is for the trigger or the action button. Okay, and then pin eight is ground. So if you have one of these wires, if you have one of these wires and you connect them to your buttons and then to your control console, your, um, your Atari, your ColecoVision, your Sega Genesis, then that's pretty much it. That's all you, you can do. Um, it's a little, it's, it's a very popular design that was used on many computers throughout the years. Um, so when Atari just kind of came up with the standard for their computers, a lot of other companies mirrored it. Commodore 64, ColecoVision, other game systems, Sega as well. And so that's why you have that high level of compatibility. You can build a joystick for Atari, you can build a joystick for um, Sega Genesis and use it on some of these consoles, on some of these computers. Not everything is compatible. So um, if you don't know for sure, check the pin out first. This is really important because you can see on pin seven, you've got five volts of power. And if it's not expecting five volts there, you could fry something in your system, you know, like the MSX, the Armstrad, the Sinclair, some of these computers, um, pinouts are not exactly the same. Some are, but um, use caution um, with anything that's not on this list at the top. Any questions so far? Nope, okay. Let's go on to the next page. Um, like I said, it's a serial connector, it's a molded, connector that you get when you purchase a controller, but also you may have seen these um, in computer, old fashioned computer joysticks. Um, this connector like right here, you might see on like a Gravis gamepad, um, dating myself by saying that by, you know, Gravis. <laughs> but uh, that was the way that you connected a gamepad to your computer um, before we had USB, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Don't you also see those in like older printers? Oh yeah, absolutely. Older printers, um, anything that requires serial data, it's still, it's still used in some applications. Okay. <clears throat> and if you just connect your buttons to your wires, put them in a housing, and use one of these cables, these nine pin serial cables, you can just start playing your game. That's pretty much it. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. That was... <laughs> um, it's as simple as that, honestly, and we'll get into some of the build, um, some of the build. We don't have to solder, we don't have to worry about um, electrical connections. Um, that's great because you, you, can, you can pretty much build a simple controller and put it in like a cigar box, for example, or a shoe box, as we'll go over a little later. Um, won't be very durable, but it, it will work. You can do that. You can just use wires, buttons, um, a cable, hook it up to your game system and start playing. Um, okay. But I also want to talk about other game consoles, uh, NES, SNES, and above. Okay. So up, down, left, right, and trigger are five controls, and then you've got your ground. So that's six wires that you'd need to make your basic controller. Um, but what if you have, like an NES controller, up, down, left, right, select, start, B, and A? Um, what if with the Super Nintendo, you've got the X and the Y and the shoulder buttons in there? Um, if you wanted to wire each one of those up individually with one direction or one button per, um, per input, then you would need more and more wires. Um, and the, the connectors on these systems don't have, um, say for example, Super Nintendo is what, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12, does not have 12 pins on here. So how does it work? How does it get those 12 inputs um, into the game system in a way that it can understand without having 12 separate wires? Well, then we get into multiplexers and shift registers and serial data. I'm not gonna go too much into that, but basically you can see that we have five volts like we did before. We have data, just one pin for data, one for latch. And if you remember, I said that when you press 
um, a button like a like a uh, emergency lights blinkers on your car. You press and hold it, and it holds it um, until you press it again. You don't have to keep pressing it. That's basically what latch means. Clock is timing data, and then you have a ground. And one of these one of these chips is in say your Nintendo and your Super Nintendo controller. Fun fact. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pins here on the NES, and there's seven pins on the SNES. And it looks like Nintendo just kind of grabbed the NES control pin and um, elongated it. Like these are compatible. You can make a Super Nintendo controller work on NES if you just make an, an appropriate adapter because they use the same type of technology in them. And you can kind of see that here. You see how these are colored? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four here. They're in different positions, but it's the same pins, it's the same data. Um, a chip, like a multiplexer, I think it's a 4201 um, multiplexer, or MUX, MUX for short, has um, pins on it where you can put inputs to it. Uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, up to P8. Um, it takes those, and I'm not gonna go too far into it, but basically it has um, a voltage and when you press a button, that voltage changes, okay? Um, and it starts to check for any buttons that are pressed. Uh, the system does, the video game system does. It's, uh, this chip sends it to the system. Um, the clock kind of controls um, how often that gets checked. And uh, I'm not gonna go too much into how serial works, but basically it's just checking, is this button pressed? Yes, no. Is this one pressed? And it does that either millions or, or hundreds of thousands of times per second. Millisecond, thousands of a second. Yep, thousands of a second. Thank so, you. It depends on the chip. Depends on the chip, how much latency there is. If I could jump in real quick. Please. So when you get into chips and you're talking about clocks, there's you may have heard of something called, oh, yeah, that's right, we got these. You may have heard of something called a clock cycle. And the way it works is with a, with a chip like this that has a clock, Every time that the cycle advances, the chip basically checks the state or like the situation of each individual pin. It's like, all right, is there like on off binary? Am I getting a, a signal? Am I getting voltage on this pin? Yes or no? And it checks the state on every pin on the chip and then either does some computation or processes, processes the data, uh, sends the results to an output and then the next clock uh, cycle advances, it does the same thing again. So that's when we were looking earlier at, um, what was it, clock, data, ground, that's what, those are the, uh, that's like the explanation of this. That's why it's important to have, when we talk about overclocking a CPU, that's basically checking the state that much faster. So just a little bit of context. Yep, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Glenn. So, um, I don't want to get too deep into that again, but basically I want you to get the idea that you don't necessarily need one wire per input because we have chips that will take that care of that for you. And when we get into USB, um, same thing. It checks other things like, for example, um, how often the chip is being pressed. If you're holding it down, if you have a USB keyboard, if that, you know, if you, if you expect it to um, latch something like a caps lock key, to turn it on without you continuing to press the button, or if you intend to press multiple keys, like have, have the same key pressed over and over again, uh, or, or even send data about what kind of device it is. Is it a USB keyboard, is it a printer, is it a mouse, and so on and so forth, another type of device. Um, if we didn't have this, then a USB keyboard, which has 101 or more keys, would have a connector that had 101 or more wires. But um, with this, you can kind of see how the chip or um, kind of the technology behind USB um, allows us to have as many buttons as we want um, with as many behaviors as we want, such as auto fire, without having um, a connector and without having a lot of wires to wire up. So just trust that it works. And if you want more information about that, the 8-bit guy actually has a really good video on how vintage video game controllers work. Um, that explains chip registers and serial data. Um, so I would recommend that one if you want to find out a little bit more about the technology behind multiplexers. 
Um, you, uh, speaking of U universal serial bus, um, USB, like I said, is very convenient for us for the purposes of building controllers because we have um, a board that will allow us to connect to either computer or a video game console um, without having to worry too much about how it works other than um, building our buttons and building our enclosures. So we have some options here. Like I said, we can take uh, an existing controller and modify it with better parts. Um, not gonna go too much into that, but we'll open up it in Q&A if anybody wants to hear about different buttons and joystick options. Um, we can um, take uh, an, a pre-made product off the market, something that you buy in a store, like an 8 bit controller, and drop in new buttons. Um, or we can get fancy with it and use materials such as acrylic, wood, um, particle board, I would say, and start making our own designs. And they don't necessarily have to be boxes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. They can be um, foot pedals, if you want, something that you can control with your feet. Um, or they could be some kind of um, combination of buttons, not um, and like you wouldn't see in an arcade machine, but side to side. So if it's more comfortable to press buttons on the side or have like a box that has buttons on all sides, you could do that too. If you're an indie developer and you wanna make a game with a custom interface, um, that's something that you have the option to do. Okay, so talking about USB encoders, this is a pre-made product that you can buy, um, usually in kits off of Amazon or eBay or Etsy, where you have your buttons and the wires and the harnesses. Again, no soldering required. You just um, clip them into place, put them into your, <clears throat> into your USB encoder, and um, you should be able to read the data. Every time you click a button or move a joystick, you'll see the corresponding pin uh, turn on. Um, figuring out which button does what is probably the most um, difficult part of that, um, but it's not, it's not anything um, that I think uh, you should worry too much about doing um, as compared to coming up with a design for your, for your joystick. Any questions about encoders or how you would want to do this? No? Yeah. Yes? Does anybody have like a, an encoder that will say output both a keyboard signal and a controller signal? Sure, so the question is, is there an encoder that will put out a keyboard signal and um, <clears throat> a joystick signal at the same time. I don't know of any product that does both. Um, I would think that most USB joysticks basically act as keyboards that only have certain keys, um, if that makes sense. So if you were to take apart a keyboard and rewire those buttons on the keyboard, some of them like WASD, for example, um, you could potentially use that as a cheap way to um, hook up to a joystick and not use, not buy one of these. I don't know if there's any mark, if there's any on the market that will do both. <clears throat> I do know that there are encoders that have different types of inputs for spinners or trackballs for certain types of games that require those certain types of arcade games. But as for keyboards, I don't know. I don't know if there's one that does both. Yeah. Uh, is it because you are interested in making a joystick that has both keyboard inputs and? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. Homemade, okay, okay. I don't know if there's um, one of those USB encoders that does both, but again, potentially you could hack up a keyboard and that would do what it is you're trying to, to accomplish. Okay. Good question though, I'll have to look into that. Oh, empty slide. So let's get started with building. Um, like I said before, you could mount your joystick buttons, now that you have an idea of kind of how it works, in a shoebox. And it won't be very durable for long term, but it is a good way to kind of get a sense of where you want your buttons to go before you start drilling in something more expensive like wood. Um, you can design uh, the button around your own your game. If you're interested in developing your own game, you can do, you can drill buttons based on the, your own personal preference um, so that's comfortable for you or for whoever you're building it for. Um, and you can 
come up with this and, and kind of get a sense of um, how long your wires are going to be when you um, do it in the actual enclosure. That too, like that's kind of important if you want to keep things neat. So you can see how long your wires need to be for that. Prototyping. <clears throat> Prototyping, which is actually in my slide transition. One thing that I really like doing is finding these old cigar boxes um, lying around. Sometimes you can get them from stores um, that are throwing them out or at thrift shops um, to build either permanent controllers or for prototyping too. They're e really easy to work with. The, the wood is not too thick. You can drill holes easily um, into them and they make you know, a very nice, simple controllers. They're usually hinged so that you can open it up and make modifications, repairs, or kind of you know, um, have a fun weekend project um, and, and have something that actually works, but is also easy to go in and, and change up later without having to unscrew it or um, to have something that's more mounted permanently like this lower left-hand corner controller box, which while it looks really nice, I think it might be a little more involved to try to get in there and, and move things around a bit. Um, you can use plastic project boxes, acrylic, like I said, which is a little bit more difficult to work with because it cracks uh, if you're not careful when you drill into it. Um, particle board is another option. Um, durability versus ease of, ease of use, ease of uh, working with when you're designing or building in the first place are some considerations you might want to think about. What are some other materials that you might um, yeah, yes. Pegboard. Which one? Pegboard? 3D printed, exactly, yeah, absolutely, 3D printed. Um, uh, red and white jacket? Pegboard. pegboard as well? Pegboard, I'm not sure if that would work well because it already has little holes in it, so when you start drilling, I mean, that's, oh, that's a very good point, it gives you a graph, yeah, so it might be a little weak depending on where you drill because it already has those holes. So, depending on what games you're playing with. Uh, yeah, definitely prototype, not prototype, yeah, certainly for prototyping. And it is a cheap material that's readily available. So, MDF, MDF yeah. Uh, medium density foam, is it? Medium density? Medium density. MDF. I'm just fiber, fiber. Thank you. Medium density fiber. Yes, absolutely. That's also very easy to work with because it's kind of like pieces of material glued together. So, it's very uniform, right? Uh, but also fireproof, <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, you can also look to the uh, DIY guitar pedal building community. There are some very creative uh, enclosures that I've seen. I, I used to build guitar pedals, and one of the things I did was I, uh, I made a fuzz pedal out of a dual gang junction box. By the way, the metal for that is very tough, so be prepared to drill for a long time. But you can use, the, the point is, like that was like, mostly pre-made and it was just a matter of punching in the holes. Yeah. So and those are usually aluminum, which is, which is you know, really durable material. Oh, yes. that, that stuff was galvanized yeah. steel and it sucked. Yellow, yellow shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a requirement because as long as your, your wires are not touching the housing, you should be okay. And your wires, your wires will be um, insulated you have connectors, which I can show later, which as long as you wrap them in electrical tape or if you make sure that they're not physically touching the outside enclosure with the metal part, then they won't short out. If they short out, we're dealing with very low um, voltages here, five volts or less. And so you're not going to get electrocuted. It won't be um, a danger to you or to your house wiring. You're not gonna start a fire. Um, the worst thing that could happen, yeah, yeah, I know. Let's. You know, I can't say I can't say that without like I use caution and say and say like, you know, it's a disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. You know, anything could happen. We do not assume any responsibility for any house fires <laughs> yes. that that Results arise from you building your controllers. Sure. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> sure. Sure. Absolutely. It can if you have you know kindling or, or lint, like dryer lint, something like that. Absolutely. Probably the worst thing that will happen is. Um, the button will short out and it'll magic it'll, smoke. It'll work um, when you don't want it to. It'll be pressed down when you don't want it to be pressed down. Or like I said before, if you plug it into your game console and you're not 100% sure of what pin it's supposed to go in, then it might go into the pin that will burn out your console. 
So be very careful with that. Yes, you had a question as well. Red, uh, Red Kangle. Yeah. Uh, um, I was going to say, as far as insulating the components, um, beyond the electrical bit, there's a stuff called Kapton bit. Oh, Kapton. Using that I've used hot glue. Yeah. Also. That's, that's not as insulating. It's also yeah. Yeah, so Kapton tape uh, is a good is a good thing to bring up. Electrical tape is kind of thicker. It's it's rubberized on the outside. Kapton is insulating, but it's also very thin. It's almost like a scotch tape in thinness, but it is also a good insulator. So you could put that tape over things if you're worried about um, accidentally shorting something out and having an aluminum enclosure. So there's a lot of build considerations. That's the fun part. Yep. Heat shrink wrap. Yes, exactly. So. Um, I'm not too worried about going into that right now because when you have wires, they are usually not exposed wires. They have um, uh, insulation around them. When you have connectors, they will have an insulator on all but the business end of it. So if you see something touching something else that's metal, you might have a problem. Otherwise, I think you should be okay. Yeah, this is the fun part. This is kind of the build part where you get dirty, and get your hands into the um, nuts and bolts of it, which I really enjoy. Uh, at the end of the day, you have a controller that you can play video games with, but also, you know, it's kind of fun to both design and build something and then be able to use it and enjoy it or maybe gift it to somebody and then do make more and more builds and get better at it. Okay, so materials. Um, I want to talk about those designs, actually, that I was talking So once you have an understanding of how the buttons work and how you can connect them to your game system, you can go crazy with the designs. Um, anybody familiar with the Smashbox at all? Yeah, yeah. And the reason for the Smashbox is because those um, Smash players are very competitive and they do a lot of repetitive motions with their fingers and those controllers are getting harder to come by, the original ones. Um, there's replacements, they're not exactly the same. And a lot of people are complaining that their fingers hurt after a while, especially when you get older, just doing some of those, um, the dashes and things like that. Very repetitive, it's hard to do. Um, one solution is to create a hitbox to create this controller where you have a little bit more control. Um, you can play competitively with these. I think there's a little bit of controversy about that. I don't wanna get into that too much, yeah. Um, but basically you have more control because your fingers are spread out. You're able to, to control more effectively than you can with just your thumbs. Um, and in the long term, maybe uh, avoid any potential like injuries as well. It's easier on your wrists, easier on your hands, your fingers, your thumbs, and so on. Um, that might be a consideration. Also, if you have any uh, health issues or if you have mobility issues with your fingers, this is a great way to kind of continue to play video games and be able to um, uh, enjoy games without pain or without uh, discomfort. Okay. A special note is this controller I found online that this is interesting. There's kind of like a handle on the left hand side, if you see that, like a joystick handle and the buttons on the right. So it's kind of like a hybrid joypad slash arcade controller solution. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about accessibility controllers that exist on the market that are already pre-made. The Xbox One, I think Logitech also makes one, the adaptive controller it's called. Um, it's great because you can remap any of these buttons to whatever fits your needs. The buttons are large and in different shapes. You can put them on the floor, like I said, to use as foot pedals or however is comfortable for you. Um, some people use these to gain a an, an, uh, competitive edge over their competition when they're playing online. But some people, this is the only way that they can play because either they don't have that mobility uh, to use a joypad the way other people do or because it hurts when they do. Uh, especially if you start getting older and you start getting a little bit of, of arthritis and you spend a lot of time on your computer, you're gonna feel that maybe your clicking fingers, your mousing fingers hurt all day from working. And then when you, you know, try to relax and play your game, they'll hurt some more. You can really do some damage. Yes? Yeah. Ah. So a lot of things I'm very scared. So operating controllers is difficult. So what I was thinking is using two controllers for navigation, moving back and forth, and and also with the gun stuff. Oh sure, sure. For, uh, there is this, this is a commercial um, product, uh, the Xbox Adaptive Controller. 
which again works with PC, and I believe it's universal for Xbox 360 and One X. Yeah. Um, so it it yes. Um, I don't know if there's any specific foot pedals, but you can kind of see this um, section here. These two arcade buttons. You could, it has a wire that connects to the main component, which is this DJ looking thing, um, and you could put it on the ground, and you could use it as a foot pedal or from. Like Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, like the pads. Or potentially from kind of the things that we've talked about here, you can adapt the Dance Dance Revolution pad um, to be able to work with this. Um, if you have a USB Dance Dance Revolution pad, you can kind of um, break it out and connect it to this device, and it would be one of the um, um, control options for this device. So you can use Dance Dance Revolution Well, there are lots of really amusing videos of people like absolutely slaying using a DDR controller in like Counter Strike or the yeah there are, or the Rock Band controllers. Mm -hmm. Like, there's somebody like just like massacring people with like the drums and the DJ one and the yeah. the cool. like. You can go down that rabbit hole in your own time. But yeah, there are lots of really creative uses for off the pro off the shelf products out there. Yeah, I've seen Get people. Inspired play really well um, games that weren't designed for it, like the, the Donkey Konga, Congo, uh, like Bongo <laughs> controllers to play games. And um, yeah, you can, it, this, is, this is your opportunity to kind of um, see what works for you and design a controller that fits your needs. You can buy foot pedals, um, like Glenn said, um, for, for guitars and repurpose them to work with a controller. So you can do, like a yeah, like a stomp box, exactly. You can certainly do that. Well, if you just connect, if you get rid of the electronics altogether and just connect to the switch itself, it has a switch in there, right? Um, it might be overkill, certainly, because it's a very stiff switch. Like a well, wah pedal would be analog, you know? A wah pedal would have degrees of pressure. So, <clears throat> degrees of motion, which run faster. You could do that. Again, out of the scope of this panel, uh, we're not going to do analog in that way, but you could wire it up to um, fully pressed or not fully pressed, and that would be a digital control there. Really, the big thing is, as long as the controller talks to the console or the platform that you want to use, then it's just a question of mapping. Yeah. Um, oh, and Glenn, I do want to pass some of these around, so if you don't mind, just oh. going around. So see, these are going to be micro switches that I'm going to be passing around, and a couple of the joysticks that I was talking about if you're interested in that. And there's that green panel with the three buttons on top. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, ergonomics, accessible design, um, and alternative control methods. Um, the banana piano, yes. Has anyone seen this before? Yeah. Bananas and the human hands are conductive. You can be the controller. You can be the buttons. If you press these buttons and you have it hooked up to a, con a computer, an Arduino, some kind of input device, um, some kind of encoder, then you can actually make bananas be your controller. They get mushy after a while, after like, I don't know, three or four hours, depending on how, how much you're pressing down on them. But when you touch those bananas, you can close a circuit and you can control something that way. Um, that's more fun. We have a friend named Claire Kwong, an artist who um, works with alternate control, control methods. And she makes, um, she makes kind of, uh, uh, inputs using the the connect and encourages people to play in different ways. Um, she makes games and installations where she encourages people to move around um, and and use the connect to kind of figure out their position in space and their relative position to other people. Um, going back to the Nintendo, there was a device I I had back in the day called the U Force, which uses infrared technology to kind of sense where your hands are. You don't touch it at all. This, it never worked very well at the time, I thought, but it's also hands-free, so you could adapt this to work with a computer, to work with another game system, and if you're interested, you could, be, you could get pretty good at it if um, you had no other way or if you were interested in just exploring that control method. And uh, Herna, which is a game downstairs in the, um, um, in the arcade section, um, uh, Momo, uh, Momo Pixel, I believe, is a developer, and Wonderville made a cabinet of it. 
which is all about exploring um, the idea of not, not touching a person of color's hair um, at all. So they use a connect to kind of, you, you kind of use your hands to like bat people's hands away from someone's hair. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, idea of, of exploring the, the concept of, of uh, you know, touch controls or in this case, not touch controls. Because I also, we had a friend, I don't, I don't remember who they were, but they, they did live visual art where they mapped a PSP controller which had buttons, joy pads, and the velocity uh, control mechanism. So by like pressing a button and sort of like twisting and like physically twisting and turning. Oh, I think it was SB3. Oh yeah. 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 Um, Steve, our, our friend Steve Boyer up in New York uh, mapped a PSP controller that would, just, and it was wireless, so he could like do visuals and walk around the crowd, mm -hmm. and like have basically complete control. Yeah. So it's not just it's not just um, buttons, joysticks, or um, sen uh, Switches, physical, in physical sensors, physical, but also yeah. like uh, motion sensors. Absolutely. So you can have absolutely. a controller and not even need to press anything. You could just like yeah, yeah, and. I Those are, yeah, they have 3D accelerometers and infrared sensors and the switch controllers. Um, so that's, again, out of the scope of, of this panel. But those, those do sense motion and space and kind of um, movement. So um, how fast you move um, something. Uh, switch controllers and also Wii controllers to a lesser extent kind of use some of the same technology. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a good time to stop for Q&A. How am I doing on time here? If anybody has any more questions, I think we're, you know, wrapping up, and then I can show you some of the things I have on the down shoot. But any any more questions about some of the things we've we've covered today? Yeah. I'm so used to working with the USB encoders on arcade machines, mm -hmm. but for something like the Nintendo keyboards, where do you find the chips? Where are they going to get these kind of parts? Oh, yeah. sure. Um, so luckily, the internet I think is still working here. That's okay. Um, the multiplexers, console five, um, dot com is a great place to get replacement parts, repair parts. Um, so if you do look for NES, you will find the 4201 that I was talking about earlier. Um, let's see here. We've got encoders, we've got capacitors. Um, I'm just going to look for it here. Yes. Multiplexer. Console5.com. It looks like consoles. Let's see. Console 5 NES controller. Maybe that'll work. Using replacements, pins. I totally had it before. This Google, Google is not as great as it used to be. Um, I know the replacement parts for NES. Um, it is actually a part that you can buy on, on any um, electronic supplier such as Micro Center or, um, or uh, uh, what's, what's the uh, DigiKey, uh, Mauser, for example. It's just, it's just, so let's see, 4201 multiplex, multiplexer. Um, also, you could take apart an old NES controller and get it from there if you wanted to do that. Um, Wait, point you to this particular controller from Radio Shack, this Archer. This was a piece of junk when it was new, and it's doubly so now. So I, don't, I have no compunctions about take, taking this apart and using the parts in it for something else. It's not a very good controller. The buttons are mushy. They don't feel very well. So um, you can use the parts of an existing controller for your build if you want to. Um, let's see. That's not exactly what I want, but... That was one of my references, actually, and I'll put I'll push that up on the screen. Console five slideshow. There you go. Um, that's one place where you could get them. Console5.com, very good place for a uh, very good resource for parts for video game consoles. They've done the work of like wading through um, um, a more complex site like Mauser, a more comprehensive site like Mauser, and picking the ones that are actually being used in the game systems. Um, sometimes the spec sheets will say that um, a certain part can do this, but you really have to kind of 
go into the, the data, data sheet and see exactly what it's doing. They've done that work for you and they sell the parts that will work in your game consoles. So I really like that website. Let's go back for a second. I'll try one more time to find it. And console by Nintendo. That might work. Cap kids. Yeah. Any other questions while I'm looking for this? The reference way? Sure. Just one second. I have a question. Question. So D pads, that's that's sort of the vernacular for the up, down, left, right on an old school NES controller. Those are pretty much binary. There were, there were switches on, off for up, down, left, right. But uh, like modern controllers, uh, like your Xbox controller, those joysticks, when you lean, when you lean forward or you move forward or any specific direction, you can move faster or get like some granularity. It's not just an on off. So do you know what the, like what kind of sensor is, is there, like what mechanically is happening in that controller? Is it a pressure sensor that's then sending data to the actual uh, chip in the controller? Like what's happening in there? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that whole part. I did pull up the 4201 register. Um, this, yeah, this is this is a chip that you could use. And um, again, I would recommend cannibalizing an existing um, controller to take the parts out of there um, from an NES controller, just because it's already in there and you know it's going to work with your NES, and also because it's already wired up. So let's take a look. Let me make this screenshot a little bit bigger um, here. Yeah, there's the chip right there. And trust me when I say that these wires are connected on the other side with, with a PCB to this chip, and they're already going to the, to the wires. So you can take an existing mod and, and, and just rewire the buttons to it on the other side. And I'll show that on the camera in a second, how you can do that. But what was your question again while I'm setting up the camera? Okay. <laughs> so on, a, on an older controller like that, your D-pad, up, down, left, right, there's basically underneath under the hood, it's binary switches, or like, yeah, just on off, like one or zero input for state. But with modern controllers, modern joysticks, like your thumb pad or the thumb stick, you, how far you move the stick, you get some granularity in the, um, in the response. So what is actually happening under the hood? Like mechanically, is, there, is, is it a pressure switch? that is sending different data to the chip in the controller, how does that work? Oh, sure, and that's, that's out of the scope of, of what we're doing here. We're just doing on and off, you know, switch is pressed, switch isn't pressed, but for analog, we have um, a mechanism that has usually spring-loaded, right? Because you press it and then you let it go, it goes back to the center. So the spring puts it back to a zero position, mm -hmm. but um, think about your mouse. There's an X axis and a Y axis. And depending on um, how you move your mouse, how quickly you move your mouse, all that's being sensed. Um, it's kind of mathematical data, uh, positioning coordinate data. You know, it's telling the computer this um, is in this position um, based on the re uh, resistance values or based on some other uh, kind of sensor of where position and space something is. Um, you press it, you, you add um, pressure to it, you add pressure direction and speed, and it measures that and compares it against what was previously there and gives uh, that, that data back to the control, uh, back to the console. Um, think of a, a racing game where you're pressing the triggers and you have the, the, the uh, gas and the brake. Okay, so you, you depress the, the pedal and there's a little bit of resistance and that position gets transferred back to the system and it kind of knows how far and how quickly you're pressing the gas in the brake. Yeah, if that helps. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's look at this down shoot here. Again, I've taken apart this Atari controller. Um, you see some metal pads here. I don't know if you can see how well you can see those, but there are metal pads that are connected to the wires 
And those pads there um, are basically what's underneath the plastic button. Um, and you can see that there's a little bit of a trace there. So you see how you can follow the wire out um, and then kind of where it goes to these points here that are soldered in um, and goes to those wires. You can go ahead and follow those either using a multimeter or either just using your eyes and the different wires, different colors, you can cut those wires and you can attach your connectors and attach them to your arcade buttons from there. Okay, so taking an existing controller um, and, and kind of doing that on the fly um, without having to, to um, worry about encoders is um, one of the best things about a serial um, controller like an Atari controller. Yeah. I hope everybody feels inspired to kind of explore their own designs and make something that works for them. Um, have fun with it. Have fun with designing your controllers, again, for ergonomics or accessibility. Um, and I hope this was um, kind of useful. Yep, question. Um, I think YouTube has some really good video tutorials. I can't recommend any specific ones um, because the scope is so wide, you know? A lot of, a lot of controllers about making fighting game um, joysticks, but not so much about other types of joysticks. So I don't want to recommend any specific person. Yes, question. Um, I know also just looking up local maker space, space, I don't want to help there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And he only had like four points for those like analog things, specifically two analog pins, is it four, is it eight? Like, mm -hmm. It does vary. It really depends on what kind of sensors they have. If they only have four, like I said, um, there should be, there might be an encoder not in the controller itself. There could be one in the system that's designed to read that particular controller. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not always um, a direct input, but USB is pretty standardized. Um, so you can, you, can, you can kind of take something apart like a mouse, for example. I know that it's going to have it up and down and the side to side, and those will be your inputs. Yes. Yep. Uh, as far as I understand, there's like a specific kind of board for Xbox specific uh, fighting, um, fighting controllers. So. Sure. You should be able to, there's no reason why not. Um, you, can, you can definitely add a joystick because as we covered earlier, a, a Smashbox, a, uh, one of these devices, uh, if you were to design it, you can see that someone has made their own version of it here. So you don't have to buy their official Hitbox product. You can make your own. Um, you could, instead of having up, down, left, right here, you could, add a joystick here and a joystick will just have four different button inputs, four switches. So you could replace that. You can make that modification yourself. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I have the idea of alternating between the two. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how, if you could do it, you know, if you could just like take a joystick out and then drop it in. I'm not sure if they have that, but you could certainly have um, two joysticks or, you know, you can make that, that change relatively quickly if you're interested in doing that. Yeah. But one more question, and then I'm gonna. Oh, good question. So I'm not an expert on Smash in that way, but um, as, if you have a joystick, you can only press it right, and you can't press it left because of the way it's designed. But as you can see in this hitbox, you could actually press left and right at the same time. Right, so um, that gives some players a competitive advantage because they could be charging and moving forward at the same time. How how is that regulated? I'm not sure. I don't. I think this is um, legal for Smash right now. Um, I'm not sure how or why that works. Like, why is it legal? When um, I think it wasn't before. One of their products was not legal before. I've, yeah, for Street Fighter, they won't allow that because it gives someone a competitive edge if they can, you know, be be charging a, a sonic boom, for example, while they're moving forward. And, you know, and it kind of the game wasn't designed that way. Um, I don't know how they regulate that. 
Um, I, I don't know, like you can make this controller for your own benefit for, for again, for playing at home. Um, once you come into competitive play, then you have to worry about whether someone else will accept that as your legitimate input device. Yeah, software might be regulating that too well, like a something on The software might be regulating that? Sure. Yeah, so we're getting a little bit, we're getting a little bit more um, uh, advanced on that. If, if the software is able to check for that and limit that kind of action so that no one has a, a competitive edge because of their controller in that, in that regard. Yeah, um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. It is Sunday, 11.30 a.m. on the last day of MAG. Happy MAG, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming here. Yeah. Thank you to my assistant, Glenn, and also to Dana um, Underwood, who designed the, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and again, to Julio, thank, you know, uh, love you, Julio. Wish you could have been here for this one. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. And yeah, we're gonna start wrapping up because there's another panel pretty soon, but I'll be here for a few minutes if you have any follow-up questions. Thanks, everybody.